Hey everyone, today's video is an interview with New Testament scholar Dr. Bart Ehrman. I'm helping him get the word out about one of his upcoming online courses, The Bible and the Quran, comparing their historical problems. This is a two-day course consisting of eight lectures that will be recorded live on May 4th and 5th. The lectures will alternate between Dr. Ehrman and a scholar of Islam, Dr. Javad Hashmi, as they discuss topics like the origins of these texts, their historicity, and their textual transmission. If you'd like to register, just follow the link here on screen or click the link pinned in the comments below. And without further ado, here's Dr. Bart Ehrman. All right, everyone, I'm here with Dr. Bart Ehrman. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I wanted to segue into this conversation by comparing, by making a comparison between the formation of the New Testament canon and the formation of the Quran. So according to Islamic tradition, the Quran is believed to be the words of God orally revealed to Muhammad, who then recites the words to his companions. But there's this whole other phase that's sometimes forgotten, which is the, the third caliph, Uthman. Uh, so according to tr tradition, you have a bunch of variant versions of the Quran floating around. Uthman destroys these variants and then standardizes the text of the Quran and then sends these these copies of the standardized Quran out to everybody else. And this is the version that we have today. Uh, now, this whole Uthmanic standardization process has come under some uh, scrutiny in recent years, particularly by Dr. Stephen Shoemaker at the University of uh, Oregon, I believe. And I would like to make the comparison. Do we see anything of the sort of a centralized standardization process uh, in the formation of the New Testament canon? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's, um, you know, there, there are kind of two things involved. One, one is in terms of the basic answer in terms of kind of a hierarchical top-down approach, no. <laughs> uh, even in deciding, you know, which books should be in the canon, you know, with with the uh, with the Quran, you've got the Quran, uh, and there are, of course, other Islamic holy books. But with the New Testament, this you have these twenty-seven books, and there was never, you know, like an emperor or a pope or something who decided. Uh, they it was a matter of uh, debates for many centuries about which books uh, to include. And in some senses, um, there never was complete closure on it. There was never a church council uh, that voted on it. Not, I mean, people tend to think the Council of Nicaea did it. Or yeah, I mean, this this is the really common, This, I mean, this is a common thing here on social media all the time, that there was like, oh, the Council of Nicaea or some council. So you're saying there was not like a definitive council that was like, this is the New Testament. No, so you know they, I, I, people, I think people started getting that, especially from the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> Dan Brown's <laughs> book, is an inimitable historian of early Christianity, Dan Brown. But no, it's completely wrong. They didn't even talk about the can, the canon, as they, you know, what books would be in the New Testament at the Council of Nicaea, or any of the other ecumenical councils, or uh, any official decisions. It wasn't until the Council of Trent in the 16th century <laughs> that there was any kind of council that made a decision. There, there were smaller synods here and there, like in North Africa, you know, there'd be some place where some bishops would say this, but but there's no top-down decision about which books belonged. And there were debates for centuries. And even today, there are parts of the world that have different uh, books and some additional books in the New Testament and so forth. So in terms of the, which books are going to be considered sacred, there is nothing. But also in terms of like what form of the text, where like somebody comes along and says, boom, it is this. Yeah, that didn't happen either. It's it's one of the striking differences we'll be seeing in this course, I think, that uh, with, with you know, Javad Hashmi is that in the Quran, there, you know, it's not that there are no variants. There are variants, but it was uh, it was not the kind of thing with the New Testament where you have monks in monasteries, you know, in France or in in Syria or in Egypt, like just independently copying stuff and making mistakes and changing things and adding things or taking things away with no no central control at all. So that the New Testament manuscript tradition is very different in many ways from the Quranic. I, so the the common narrative is that this, this top down approach, people blame popes or councils or bishops. I sometimes wonder, can we frame the formation of the New Testament canon as more of a a reaction, where the the authorities are reacting to the books that are popular? I mean, Paul's books seem to have been circulating. You know, the letters of Paul seem to have been circulating as a collection pretty early. If we look at the papyrological evidence, can we say that the you know, the elites, the bishops are like, oh, this is what people are reading. We should respond by canonizing this, saying this one you shouldn't read as more of like, um, you know, a reactionary process as opposed to a, t a top down process. 
Well, I'd say there was a lot of action and reaction going on. Um, one one difficulty is that most people could not read. And so it isn't the kind of situation where like people would have a private copy of, you know, Paul's letter to the Philippians and kind of push for it. It's like most people weren't reading. And so the reading was basically done in communal settings for the most part. Um, in in the first century itself, when Paul was writing, probably like 90% of the population couldn't read at all, and probably a lower percentage among the Christian churches for a variety of reasons. And so if if a church had a copy of a text, they would read it. And some churches would, would favor some texts over others. Um, so there are debates, you know, the, there, you know, we have accounts, for example, of of, um, of the Gospel of Peter, which it did not make it in, being a preferred text in one community, uh, but other communities not, or the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel. But eventually, it, it you know, it is it is uh, top down in the sense that it's the leaders of the churches who were literate; they're the ones who chose what to read, and they communicated with each other more than other folk did, and so there is a kind of a uh, a consensus that emerges, but it emerges among the church leaders who tend to be the literate folk. Uh, and it's a it's a consensus that it does emerge out of conflict because there are various church leaders who think one thing or the other. You know, some like the book of Revelation and some hate it, you know, and so it ends up being a, a you know, a, a debate that lasts for a very long time. Yeah. And of course, we can't completely cut out the elite voice here because they're the ones copying the books too. So it's not like... I sometimes describe the canonization process as a popularity contest. You know, some gospels were just more popular, you know, but who were the ones copying the books? It was the, the small percentage of the population that were able to read and write and then copy and disseminate the books that were popular. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting. People don't notice it very much, but you know, when Paul writes his letters, it's clear that he has as many enemies as friends. And surely these people were writing things too, if they were literate. We don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> and so, and man, we wish we did. But uh, because Paul became such an important figure in Christianity, then his books got in and the other books did not. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I know, popularity contest. Another thing that comes up in these discussions is you have the canonical and non-canonical. You have this kind of what I consider a simplistic bifurcation between books that you should read and books that you shouldn't read. But when you look at some of these bishops, so I'm thinking of Athanasius right now, who famously writes, the, I think it's Festal Letter number 39 in 367. He's the first to list out the exact same 27 books that we have in our modern New Testaments. Uh, and he doesn't really have two categories. He has three categories. He has the books you should accept, the books you should reject, and then books that he considers good for teaching, but maybe we shouldn't accept them in the canon. And I think he lumps in books like The Shepherd of Hermas into that category. Could you speak a little bit more about some of these edge case books that were useful for instruction, but maybe not inspired canonical? Yeah. And of course, that that's his own kind of view of things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there were other uh, church leaders who had different views even in alexandria my my first uh my first uh academic article was on the canon text of didymus the blind who was uh you know in alexandria at the same time as athanasius and who included other books in, in apparently it included other books in his canon including the shepherd um and we have a fourth century uh manuscript that appears to be connected with Alexander from the same time that that actually has the shepherd and the Bar book of Barnabas as part of the canon. Um, and Athanasius himself earlier in his career actually quoted the shepherd as, as scripture. So there's there are all these kind of these kind of fuzzy, fuzzy lines. But I think I think you're right that back then most people had fuzzier lines in more than two categories. And so uh, famously Eusebius uh, who's writing, you know, half a century earlier, basically, he, or, you know, a little bit more than that, he, he has these categories of books that are accepted, books that are debated, and books that are spurious, that are, you know, are not to be accepted. And even in the spurious books, some are heretical, and some are 
uh, are are orthodox, but you know they're not re they're rejected. But he has a whole category of books, so many of which got into the New Testament that he simply calls the term he uses anti legomena. They're spoken against. <laughs> Meaning, that some people think yes, some think no, including you know you know like you know the Book of Revelation, for example. Yeah, the example I like to think of is the Codex Sinaiticus, which is one of the more famous you know copies that we have. And I believe it, I know the Epistle of Barnabas is in that codex. I believe the Shepherd of Hermas is, is in in it as well. And I just find that so interesting that somebody had this this codex and these two books that we do not have in our New Testaments were part of that. And I guess there's a lot of debate over were those considered canon to whoever compiled that text. But that's one example. Well, there, there's mainly a debate because some people just can't believe it's possible, <laughs> so they debate it. But I mean, it's they're in they're in there, and there's nothing to differentiate them from the other books that are in there. They're in the table contents. They're there, and you know, about the, a little bit later, there's a co Codex Alexandrinus, which has First and Second Clement. Um, first Clement is understandable. Second Clement's a puzzle because I guess it was circulated with First Clement, but it's a much later book and nobody, nobody really talks about it as canonical, but it's there in this manuscript as if it were you know, as in from the 5th century, early 5th century. One of the discussions about canon that I really appreciate is from David Brackey and he, he's talking about Athanasius and how he views canons as kind of discussions and debates between communities. It's not like we're just talking about books. We're talking about authority figures that that argue with each other. We you know, we mentioned Athanasius's letter that mentions these 27 books. Well, that's Athanasius's opinion. And we know that Athanasius himself had debates. I believe he was even banished a few times. So it's not like his what he said, you know, was was, you know, scripture as it were for everybody. And when I think about texts like the the Nag Hammadi codices, you know, the so-called lost Gnostic gospels or the lost Gnostic texts. I, I believe Dr. Brackey talks about styles of Christianity. So you have Christianities that were focused around a charismatic leader, maybe like, uh, uh, you know, the Valentinians, for example, who would, who would cleave to this one teacher like Valentinus, who would then promulgate texts himself. And those were as good as scripture for these these communities. When, when we think about canon, like what, what was the impulse to canonize? I know this is getting a little bit more into religious studies uh, theory and method, but like why why canonize texts? Yeah, well, I don't think it's just, you know, kind of uh, religious studies theory, because there, there's a very serious historical component uh, tied up into it. And um, you know, canon is an interesting phenomenon, in, in especially in that world, because uh, the other religions of the empire, <laughs> you know, the, in the Roman world, they didn't have scriptures in that sense. I, I think some people imagine maybe that Homer functioned as a scripture, but it didn't. It wasn't seen as some kind of sacred revelation. The myths weren't understood to be scriptural. They were just really great stories about things the gods were doing and so the you know the other religions didn't the the one exception of course is is judaism um that had a torah and had actually you know ends up with a with a canon and so the question is why a canon i think i think with christianity um it's something distinctive about the christian message that leads them to to need a canon the uh it it's rooted in the idea that christians promoted that their views were the only true views that the other the other religions of the empire were not exclusivistic saying you know that you know we worship apollo and man if you don't worship apollo you're going to go to hell <laughs> there was nothing like that is like you worship zeus i worship you know you should worship apollo too <laughs> and so the idea is that you you worship whichever gods you feel like worshiping but christians said no there's there's only one God, which Jews had said, but Jews hadn't said, you know, he's going to punish you if you don't believe in him. Christians had the idea that you have, there's only one God, there's one truth, one son of God who died for the sins of the world. If you don't believe in this God in this way, you will be punished because you'll be wrong. <laughs> there's only one right answer and everything else is wrong. And Christians, Christians are emphasizing that. But if you say there's only one right answer, uh, and you've got lots of communities, Christian communities, that have varieties of that answer. They all can't be right. And so there's something about this exclusivity that leads to the idea that there's got to be a set of authorities. Um, and, uh, you know, authorities uh, are related to authors. You need you need authors who have authority. And so you pick books that are allegedly written by apostles of Jesus, 
or by people who were um, who were compa companions of apostles of Jesus, and they become your authority so that you know you to believe this and not that. And so you accept, you know, the gospel of John, but you don't ex accept the Valentinian gospel of truth. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't heard drawing together the exclusivity and canon because I've, I believe I've read that it's been theorized that Christian exclusivity and totalistic my way or the highway also contributed to the, the success or the growth of Christianity. It did. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it was the only, I mean, Judaism, of course, Jews worshiped only their God, but they didn't care if anybody else did. This is, you know, it was their religion, their God, their customs. Christians insisted on the exclusivity. And the other thing that made the other thing, the reason it ended up leading to Christianity success was for the other element that was unique, which was that Christians were also evangelistic. Since they thought they alone had the truth, they wanted to convert people because they didn't want their friends and families all to go to hell. So they were out there trying to convert people, unlike any other religion. And they said well, they were the only, only ones that were correct. And so that combination ended up absolutely leading to the success of Christianity because if you if you've got you know if you got somebody who's trying to get you to worship Apollo and somebody who's trying to get you to worship Jesus and you're a pagan, well if you worship Apollo, you you agree to add Apollo, then you remain a pagan. But if you start following Jesus, you got to give up everything else. And so every time somebody becomes a Christian, Christianity gains somebody and the pagan religions lose somebody. And you do that for a few hundred years and you know you 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 have half the empire. <laughs> because there, nobody else is doing this. You're the only one who's who's gaining and destroying the other things in its wake. And of course, we're talking about varieties of Christianity that focus on this totalistic viewpoint. I like terminology that my dissertation advisor, David Frankfurter, uses, which is you have the syncretists and the anti-syncretists. So syn syncretism being this concept in religious studies of you know mixing and melding religious ideas, assimilating religious ideas, indigenizing religious ideas. And we see Christians that free, freely syncretize. They, they happily mix and match ideas. We especially see this in magical papyri, magical practice. But then you see anti-syncretists, both in a ritual practice way, like, oh, don't put you know, that Greek God on your amulet, you should only be able to do the sign of the cross. And I think we see the syncretist, anti-syncretist movement in canonizing as well, where you have people that happily adopt books and ideas that are, whether or not someone calls it canonical, and then you have this variety of Christianity that becomes the dominant form that, that, that canonizes, like you can't read this book or this book is not accepted. Yeah, I think, well, I think when you have that kind of competition, the anti-synchronists almost always war win because, again, they, you know, they're not open to a, a wide range of things. It's one thing, but it's the one thing is the right thing. It's the right thing. And the others, it's, you know, it's just like, oh, no, no, it's much more, a lot more variety. And, and you know, it, it it's a, there's a long history to that that's still playing out today. I mean, in even in Christian communities in America, the ones that are um, really kind of hardcore our way or the highway are the ones that grow and the ones that are open and broad and take, you know, to ideas, basically, you know, they're shrinking. I also wanted to back up a bit. You mentioned, you said they're authoritative, and then you mentioned the word authors, like in one sentence. And I think that's great because so many of these texts were viewed as authoritative because of who was supposed to have written the books. And some of them, you know, we have the authentic letters of Paul, but then also we have these letters that are attributed to Paul, like First and Second Timothy in the book of Titus. So how does apostolic authority play into this process of canonization? Because sometimes there's these odd choices too, like why Mark? Uh, why why Luke? Why why don't why don't you pick somebody really, really famous, like Andrew, the brother of Peter? Like I just find it interesting that what what authorities are appealed to in the books that ended up in the canon? Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a key question and it, it is really, uh, really important. And, you know, you get a lot of non-canonical books that claim to be written by uh, all these people as well. And it's it, the, auth the author completely matters if it has to be an apostle or a companion of apostles. So, um, so yeah, which means that that book that people write books claiming to be someone that they're not frequently, which in the ancient world was considered a form of literary deceit. I mean, people mm. they the one of the Greek words for this is pseudoi, uh, mm. for you know book 
it means lies. They're just, mm. they consider them lies. And so, but, you know, many Christians did this. They wrote books claiming to be Paul, some in the New Testament, lots outside the New Testament, et cetera, and, and the others. And, and so you do have to wonder, you know, why Mark, for example? I mean, and I think part of the problem is that to us, Mark seems like a, kind of like, wow, that's a strange choice. Mm. But, you know, if you think about who are the major choices, you know, you've got three or four people, basically, and you can't claim that Paul, Peter and Paul wrote everything. And so, uh, and the other thing is that there are always local favorites, right? In other words, uh, Mark may seem like an obscure choice to us, but for ancient Christians, you know, this is, he, he's, he's a companion to Paul during his travels, and he's Peter's secretary. And like, how important could he be? <laughs> and so, so I think that there's, I think you can find a reason for all of them. Um, but it is precisely to provide them with authority. Because Mark, whoever wrote this gospel doesn't claim to be anybody. And later they wanted it to be an authoritative book. And so they, they named it after somebody who would be an authority. Well, Dr. Ehrman, thank you so much for joining us. I do want to do a quick shout out for your upcoming class with Dr. Javad Hashmi, the Bible and the Quran. Could you just do a quick, quick pitch of what you'll be talking about? Well, this is going to be really interesting because, you know, I do all this historical critical work on the New Testament. You know, mm -hmm. do we know what the authors wrote? Are there contradictions? Do we, how do we find the historical Jesus? You know, these historical questions that, that critical scholars have asked of the New Testament since the Enlightenment, basically. Mm -hmm. um, Javad does similar things with the Quran. Um, he, uh, he is himself Muslim, just as I start out being Christian, uh, but he's engaged in historical critical work with the same questions with the Quran, coming away with answers that are not the traditional views that you, that everybody hears all the time. And so the way we've set this up is we're going to have four topics, uh, and we will each give a lecture on our area of expertise on that topic. And so do we have the original New Testament, the words of the original New Testament? Do we know that we have the words of the original Quran? I'll give a lecture, he'll give a lecture, and then we'll compare notes. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a debate, you know, and I'm not like championing the New Testament. He's not championing the Quran. We're just doing the historical analysis to see what's similar and different, you know, contradictions. And how do you find the historical Jesus? How do you find the historical Muhammad? Uh, turns out both are complicated. And mm -hmm. so there are a lot more similarities than people would think. And a lot of people who will be coming to the course will know some Thing, maybe a lot of things about the New Testament, but nothing basically about the Quran or the other way around. They might know a lot about the Quran, nothing about the New Testament. But the idea of doing two, these two things in tandem over two days, that's going to be, yeah, I, I don't know of anything quite like this. I think it's going to be something. Yeah, I think it's great too, because like the historical critical method is not just something used in biblical studies. Like this is a historical method that can be applied to any ancient text. And the Quran, you know, I'm a scholar of late antique Christianity, and I think the Quran is a late antique text. Like it, it's comes up out of the same uh, cultural milieu of, of Eastern Christianity in many respects. Yeah. You know, and people, people seem to some, somehow they kind of like box the New Testament thing in, like this is the, these New Testament scholars are doing these weird things with this text, you know, why don't, but man, we're just doing what historians do with texts. Yeah. And, but people don't realize that. So you do the same thing with any ancient text, but people have been reluctant to do it with the Quran. And uh, so this, for, for me, it's going to be very enlightening to see how this works. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ehrman, for joining us. Everyone, if you would like to join the class, it is on, it's a live recording on May 4th and May 5th. The link to register is pinned in the comments below. Again, Dr. Ehrman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.